Good evening. Thank you for joining us. This is Sunset News. In the next 30 minutes, we will bring you news, community talk, economic stories and indicators, tomorrow's weather, as well as sport. I am Diana Master. In the news tonight. This morning, State Prosecutor Antonia Firhoff called Arandis NIMT Campus Executive Director Ralph Bussell into the stand in the continuation of the Lipton Strasser murder trial. Bussell has been the Executive Director at the NIMT campus since 2020. He succeeded Eckhard Mueller, who was fatally shot and killed on April 15, 2019, in the position. At the time of the murder, Bussell was chief of the technical department at NIMT campus and arrived at the site only after both directors Eckhard Mueller and his deputy Hamo Helwig were already shot at point-blank range. He confessed that Mueller told him and also informed management about threats he had received against his life. Namibian police have recorded several violent crimes over the past weekend. The body of a nine-year-old boy was found in a shallow grave in the Omosati region, and a 19-year-old girl in the Omosati region allegedly attacked her grandmother and was arrested. Likewise, a man in Ocho allegedly killed his girlfriend and dumped her at her mother's front door. Furthermore, a burglar was shot dead by a police officer in Katutura. A court case continues to stall teachers' housing projects in the Kavango West and Ohangwena regions worth close to 15 million Namibian dollars, a situation which some disgruntled educators want resolved as they are forced to currently live in unconducive circumstances. Kasivi and Kachinakachi combined schools in Kavango West have been teachers' housing become what some regard as monuments instead of facilities meant to benefit educators. At Kasivi, the incomplete houses have been used as toilets by learners who opt not to go to the bushes when nature calls. And at Kachinakachi, the incomplete infrastructure stands idle while teachers have been forced to erect corrugated iron shacks to live in. The Parliamentary Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs will undertake a fact-finding visit to Boabwata National Park in Kavango East this week, prompted by a petition submitted to the National Assembly November last year by the Hambukushu Traditional Authority. The petition calls on the National Assembly to revisit a cabinet decision of 1999 that no kettle be allowed in Boabwata National Park or any other game park in the Northeast. In 1999, the cabinet decided that no kettle may be allowed in the park, mainly to prevent outbreaks of foot and mouth disease. The committee is expected to engage the Hambukushu Traditional Authority and community members, the Kiara Makan Association and Community of Omega settlement on the petition. 13 of the serviced and zoned plots in the township development Sungate at the Hosea Kutako International Airport come under the hammer tomorrow. Sungate was proclaimed a township in 2012 and it was the developer Accolade Properties Namibia's dream to make it a strategic gateway to the rest of Africa. Ernst Kabiska, executive director and shareholder trustee, told Republican this is still the dream even though only one property has been erected since 2014 when the plots in Phase 1A and 1B were serviced and sold. He says it is not a liquidation auction and the plots are being auctioned at the request of DFS to whom it belongs. With funding from Japan and support from the United Nations Development Programme, the Namibian government is rolling out an urban agriculture promotion initiative aimed at building back better after the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on food security. Here, the Chief Operations Officer of the Environmental Investment Fund of Namibia, Carl Arabib, talks about the implementation of 56 grants to beneficiaries in Vintuk, Swakopmund, Rundu, and the Daurus constituency near Malta Hohe of between 20,000 and 100,000 Namibian dollars each, and totaling 2.5 million Namibian dollars to accelerate urban agriculture before June this year. It's a trend-setting project, it's a very innovative project. We, at least in Namibia and better part of Southern Africa, talk about food production and agriculture. We, the first thing that comes to our mind are rural areas. But this is one of the first where we are looking at addressing 
uh, food production at household level under urban environments. So I would like to comment uh, the Namibian government and the partners for uh, conceptualizing this project and also for the Japanese government for making the financial resources available. And secondly, as the Environmental Investment Fund of Namibia, we are also very delighted uh, that these partners that I mentioned in my introduction uh, have uh, entrusted us to oversee the implementation of the grant facility component of, of, of this project. In community news tonight, we look at a music festival that will take place in Vinduk. But first, a quick break. Welcome back to Sunset News. The Run Funk Symphony Orchestra Berlin and the Namibian National Symphony Orchestra are not only entertaining the youth with excerpts from Peter and the Wolf, they are also preparing for a music festival taking place in Vintuk later this week. Gerin Herf reports. Let's have a look. The Namibian National Symphony Orchestra, in collaboration with the Rundfunk Sinfonie Orchestra Berlin, is hard at work preparing a classical concert to entertain music enthusiasts in March. First up is the staging of Peter and the Wolf at several schools in Windhoek under the baton of Christian Ludwig, conductor of the Dusseldorf Symphony Orchestra. The project is part of an ongoing partnership between the Lotto Stiftung Berlin and a cultural exchange program between Berlin and Windhoek supported by the German Namibian Society and the German Embassy in Namibia. According to Enrico Palacino, initiator of this project, the NNSO and the Cultural Exchange Program aims to introduce young learners to classical music, giving them a chance to experience music through instruments, played live and in the same time offering Namibian children a chance to learn music instruments at the youth orchestras of Namibia. But there's also something in store for the adults. On Thursday and Friday, the NNSO, in collaboration with the College of the Arts, hosts the Capricorn Private Wealth Classical Musical Festival at the DHPS Aula in Windhoek at 7 o'clock. This event is also conducted by Christian Ludwig. The musicians of the NNSO, together with the guests from RSB, will perform excerpts from Bizet's opera Carmen, and Namibian and German soloists will present a variety of musical pieces, mostly but not limited to the Baroque and Classic music epoch. According to Irmgard Rannesmann, chair lady of the NNSO, this festival promises to be a lovely concert featuring a wide variety of music and fun, and pure musical pleasure. The NNSO is a group of musicians who perform classical music in Namibia. It includes amateur and professional musicians as well as students from the College of the Arts who collectively work on classical musical projects. Tickets for the shows are available via webtickets.com.na at $150 for adults and $90 for pensioners and students. Exciting indeed. Next up, we take a look at the Bragvata area and the city's neglect of this area in our story of the day after the break. Thank you for staying with Sunset News. Yolanda Nell talks to a representative of the Bragbata Advisory Committee about city's neglect in the betterment of the area. 
I am Yolanda Nell bringing you news from Brackwater. For the past 18 years, Brackwater generated funds, which includes endowment and betterment, were instructed by council to be placed into two specific Brackwater generated items with interest, which the city is now unable to show. According to the agenda of Council Resolution 267 of 2012 for the Brockwater Bulk Service Master Plan, city officials acknowledged that the item numbers was created in 2004 for Brockwater, but was never applied for the booking of betterment levies and endowment payments received from the area. According to a council document, the levies and payments received from the Greater Brockwater area need to be established and transferred to the new special accounts. According to a member of the representatives to the Brockwater Advisory Committee, now, 10 years later, still none of the funds were placed in any Brockwater-specific financial item. According to him, the city's finance department has not been able to show any Brockwater betterment and endowment fees that were paid in these specifically implemented votes. He added that it was understood that these funds were placed in other Vintuk financial votes. A council resolution of 2004 indicated that the residents will pay a 9% endowment fee or alternatively a 7.5% if the developer carries all the costs for the provision of the required bulk services. All developers in Brockwater are now required to pay a 9% endowment fee despite having to provide for their own bulk services without any assistance from the city, the representative added. He said that they were happy to pay the increased 9% towards the endowment fee on condition that the city would guarantee these funds with interest for the future bulk services in the area and the developers would not be expected to fund all the services themselves. The funds should only be used for the provision of bulk services in the Greater Brockwater area, but in accordance with the latest infrastructure development contribution policy for private developers will now be made available to the whole 2011 extended boundary area. This latest policy specifies that the city is not in a position to provide municipal and bulk infrastructural services to the area until such time as sufficient urban densities have been achieved and that the cost of providing infrastructure sh shall be borne by the developers and cannot be recovered from the general taxpayer of the city. The BAC was established as the official communication medium between the city and the residents of Brockwater in 2000, but had to be reinstated eight years later due to the neglect by city officials not communicating with the committee. The city of Intuk failed to answer questions about the state of affairs in the Brockwater area, and according to the representative, they will have a meeting with the city later this week. After the break, we go to the economic news and take a look at a new data center by Paratus. Stay tuned. Paratus Namibia will be launching the first Korean neutral and the largest data center facility in Namibia in August. Paratus is investing 123 million Namibian dollars to construct the Armada data center facility, which is built on the Bragvata campus and houses two separate collocation data halls, each of which are, se are supported rather by two separate energy center pairs. Amada will help meet the ever-increasing customer demand for these services and as existing facilities in Namibia are at capacity, fill the market void. Let's have a look at your economic indicators. The Namibian dollar held its ground against the Chinese yuan but lost ground against the euro and the US dollar. It did strengthen against the British pound. On the NSX, the MTC stock is down with 2.2%, while Capricorn stock is up with 6.1%. Trustco is also down, while both the local and the overall indexes were up with 0.51% and 2.2% respectively. 
Most commodities are down, while Brent crude oil is up with 3% and trades at 112 US dollars and 67 cents per barrel. Up next is our weather forecast for tomorrow. Welcome back to Sunset News. Let's have a look at your weather. The central coast is still cloudy with the possibility of some rain. And while the south will be sunny, the maximum predicted temperature is Aranos at 29 degrees. Gobabis in the east will be sunny. The north of the country will be cloudy with the highest temperature being Ruakana at 32 degrees. In the international news slot after the break, we talk about the USA and China as well as Russia. Stay tuned. This is Sunset News. In international news, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan plans to meet China's top diplomat, Yang Jiechi, in Rome on Monday and will stress the economic penalties Beijing will face if it helps Russia and its war in Ukraine, U.S. officials say. Sullivan will warn of the isolation China could face globally if it continues to support Russia, one U.S. official said, without providing details. Officials of the United States and other countries have sought to make clear to China in recent weeks that siding with Russia could carry consequences for trade flows, development of new technologies, and could expose it to secondary sanctions. Chinese companies which defy U.S. restrictions on exports to Russia may be cut off from American equipment and software they need to make their products, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo said last week. It will be Sullivan's first known meeting with Yang since closed-door sessions in Zurich in October that sought to calm tension after an acrimonious public exchange between the two in Alaska a year ago. China is the world's largest exporter, the European Union's largest trading partner, and the United States' top foreign supplier of goods, and any pressure on Chinese trade could have knock-on economic effects for the United States and its allies. 
Sullivan told CNN on Sunday Washington was watching closely to see how far Beijing provided economic or material support to Russia. We are communicating directly, privately to Beijing that there will absolutely be consequences for large-scale sanctions, evasion efforts, or support to Russia to backfill them, he said. We will not allow there to go forward and allow there to be a lifeline to Russia from these economic sanctions from any country anywhere in the world. Sports News is up next and we talk cycling, soccer and cricket. You don't want to miss this. Welcome back to Sunset News. In your sports stories tonight, Vindok born South African national road race champion Mark Prison won his first title in the 108 kilometer Cape Town cycle tour in rainy conditions on Sunday. Namibia's Peter Shalulile scored the winning goal to help Mamelodi Sundowns complete back-to-back -back victories over CAF champions Lal Holders Al Ali. The strike took his tally to 20 goals across all competitions and his team through to the quarterfinals. The Namibian Eagles hope to complete their United Arab Emirates tour with a win against Oman today after a tough series that has seen them winning only one of their four matches to date. The Eagles won their first match against Oman by 110 runs, then suffered two losses to Arab Emirates and one to Oman. After the break, we take a look at the highlights from the show. Stay tuned. The My In A Property Show provides viewers with the best in-class property content. From looking for the perfect house to transforming it to the perfect home. With focus on interior designing, transforming your garden into a tranquil haven. To going green and having the funds and security of financing and insurance. The My In A Property Show has it all. Tune in and make your house a home with our monthly My In A Property show on Wednesday evenings at 6.30 on all the NMH Facebook platforms and our website TV channel, OneUp2, oneup2.com.
Thank you for staying with Sunset News. As always, we end the show with our news highlights. This morning, State Prosecutor Antonia Firhoff called Arandas NIMT Campus Executive Director Ralph Bussell into the stand in the continuation of the Lichtenstrasse murder trial. Bussell confessed that Mueller told him and also informed management about threats he had received against his life. Namibian police have recorded several violent crimes over the past weekend. The body of a nine-year-old boy was found in a shallow grave in the Omusati region, and a 19-year-old in the Omusati region allegedly attacked her grandmother and was arrested. A court case continues to stall teachers' housing projects in the Kavango West and Ohangwena regions worth close to 15 million Namibian dollars, a situation which some disgruntled educators want resolved as they are forced to currently live in unconducive circumstances. Kasivi and Kachinakachi combined schools in Kavango West have been teachers' housing become what some regard as monuments instead of facilities meant to benefit educators. And with that, we have come to the end of our broadcast. Make sure you join Sunset News on Facebook, on all the NMH platforms on weekdays, as well as on our website, oneup2.com. Sunset News screens on DSTV channel 285 and GoTV channel 94 every weekday from 7.30 to 8 p.m. I am Diana Master, and this has been Sunset News. Don't end your day without us.